The University of Sussex opened in 1961 and became known for its unique interdisciplinary approach to learning, its small group teaching and its internationalism. Its pioneering approach was an instant success. Today Sussex University is home to 11,000 students and enjoys international prestige and excellent league table results. This year Sussex was ranked 16th according to The Guardian, 20th according to The Times, while ranking 147th in the world. But things aren't as clear-cut as league table results. The university currently presides over a large deficit, diminishing academic staff numbers and considerable uneasiness about management at the institution. In order to understand how the university got into this position, this documentary will trace back some of the significant events in our history. The current Vice-Chancellor, Alastair Smith, took over from his predecessor when he left the institution in March 1998 to head the Rockefeller Foundation. An internal appointment from the School of European Studies, Smith came to Sussex from LSE and was seen as something of a rising star in the field of economics, having assisted the European Commission with the creation of the single market. The financial problems of the university can be traced back to 2001, when Sussex achieved a disappointing score at the research assessment exercise, which determines the level of research grants that a university is awarded from the government. Because Sussex was historically more reliant on government funding than other universities, this had significant consequences on its finances. In 2000, the university began work on a programme to provide a high-speed data network to the campus. The plan, called VADNUP, was originally budgeted at £1.5 million, but ended up costing £4.75 million. The registrar and secretary at the time, Neil Gershon, who managed the project himself instead of hiring in a project manager, had failed to take into account some key factors, such as the removal of asbestos, which significantly increased the cost of the project. An internal audit judged that there had been a lack of effective financial control over the project's budget and problems and weaknesses in the management of the project. The registrar was never officially blamed and the only mention of the fiasco in the 2004 financial statement is two lines in the entire 16-page document. As part of an initiative to increase research grant income and attract business investment to the university, the administration engaged in a series of expensive building programmes such as the Freeman Centre and the Genome Centre, both of which opened in 2003 and cost £8.5 million and £9.4 million pounds respectively. The government paid roughly half of these totals, leaving the university to find the rest, either from its own reserves or from grants. Inevitably this meant that the university ended up paying large sums for these projects. What sources questioned was whether it was correct to invest scarce resources in such projects at the expense of other areas of the institution. It is not so much the merit of the plans that were put forward, but what potentially could have been done with the money instead. In 2003, against this background of financial difficulties, the university completely restructured its academic system into the five schools that operate today. Although there was broad recognition that change needed to happen, there is strong evidence to suggest that this transition was mismanaged. The university's own review said, There was considerable unhappiness about the process of restructuring itself. The change process had not been properly managed. Staff worked very hard to try to implement change without appropriate project management from the centre of the university. Resulting in the reality for staff on the ground of Too much bureaucracy, too much paperwork, too many emails and too many priorities. The new system did not appear to have succeeded in simplifying the institution and reducing bureaucracy, as reflected by the rise in administrative staff of 125%. Interestingly, we also saw a decrease in academic staff numbers of 6.5% in the same 1997-2005 to 2005 period. The restructuring was another blow to the university's finances, as the project, managed by the registrar Neil Gershon, was budgeted for around £20 million altogether. But as with so many of the projects of this period, it ran well over budget, to the extent that one council member wondered whether the reorganisation would have been agreed had the full cost implications been appreciated. One of the university's tactics for managing its falling finances was to sell university-owned property. Recently, this included Swanborough Manor, the Isle of Thorns, and student housing in Brighton. These sales totaled £8.4 million. Other one-off windfalls came to £3.7 million in the same period. Sussex, you know, has sold its silver. The family silver's all been sold. Swanborough Manor, gone. Isle of Thorns, gone. The library insurance claim, gone. The VAT went, gone. Holland House, gone. The, the, re the residences that were all bought in the town in the early 90s, gone. All of that silver backup has gone. The reserves have gone. That's really a management problem, not a national funding problem. 
In order to save money, the university tried to reduce its staff costs by conducting two rounds of voluntary redundancies. The first, during the summer of 2003, led to the loss of around 29 academic staff and 58 support staff, at a cost of £3 million. The second, during the summer of 2005, led to the loss of around 60 members of staff and 11 members of senior management, at a cost of another £2 million. However, this led to a loss of key senior faculty, as they were those who were either close to retirement or had the opportunity to move to other good universities. Because of the need to make savings, they were not replaced. Despite these desperate measures, the university's cash reserve still shrank from £20 million in 2000 to just £3 million in late 2003. Notwithstanding these cutbacks, it has been a constant feature of this administration to almost continually undergo expensive building projects despite its lack of funds. Perhaps not surprising since Neil Gershon, responsible for most of them, once said, There is no doubt in my mind that an institution that doesn't have at least one set of builders in it all times is stagnating. Whilst it may be inconvenient, if you are not building something or converting something, then you are not doing very well. These projects include Bramber House refurbishments at 1.8 million, Sussex House refurbishments, originally drafted for 300,000 but finally revised to 1 million, the Russell Building at 1.5 million, and finally the Sussex Institute at 1.1 million pounds. Sources have told us that a large part of the problems that the university faced was because the financial director was not accountable to the VC, and instead only to the registrar, who managed the projects himself. One source said of the situation, It would have been much better to have the finance director to be on an equal footing with him, to make sure that financial decisions were made soundly, and I think that the registrar wasn't doing that. Effectively, he was spending too much money. We have been told that this is a large part of the reason why Steve Pavey, finance director at the time, announced his departure in October 2004. Sources told us that he was frustrated at being ignored when trying to communicate the severity of the situation. Shortly after, Registrar Neil Gershon took early retirement and was thanked by council at exactly the same time as practice was changed and the finance director was made directly accountable to the VC. Thus, over the years the university has increased its expenditure, but because its investments did not provide new income, it has been running deficits since 2003, and to try to control its budget had completely depleted its reserves, taken new loans and cut staff numbers which proved harmful to the academic levels of the university. As a consequence, by 2006 the university had a bank overdraft of over £4 million and debts of over £34 million. So the university is in serious trouble on paper, but what does this mean for students and staff on the ground? That's my window, which has been like that since before Christmas. It was left for like a month and a half before it got boarded up. So it was really cold when we first got back, because it's letting in loads of drafts. At the moment, kind of students feel like they're very much caught in with one big system and they're not valued as individual people because lectures are so big, seminars are so big, you don't have individual time with tutors, you don't have time to really individually say how you're feeling. Contact time this term has been, my French contact time, which was originally four hours, has now been cut to three. And especially with a language when I think you need as much contact, especially with a teacher that you can get, I don't think it's particularly acceptable. Contact hours are just a lot lower than I thought they'd be. Now in third year we get about as many contact hours as the Open University, which is I have five contact hours a week, and because I do development studies as a minor they won't let me sit on the seminars for my course. We had to mark each other's essays in the first year, no, obviously none assessed because it's the first year. We had to, in, in 100 per person seminars, we had to pass around our essays and mark each other's essays, which is absolutely ridiculous. How are you supposed to know what mark to assign someone? The university started up a drama course without really the, the, the facilities to make it work. In reality, the way I see it is they've delivered a studio space three years late uh, and that they've got three years worth of catching up to do. They're at the state now where they should have been three years ago and this is a three-year-old course that should just be starting. For staff, the situation isn't much better. I find morale to be rather upsetting, to be quite honest. It's, it's an upsetting process, an upsetting time. One staff member said of their treatment, After all the redundancies went ahead at the end of September, staff are not being replaced and therefore existing staff are picking up the flack. We are told new positions will be put in place in the future to fill in these gaps, but we were told that nearly three months ago, and nothing has changed. I have never worked anywhere where instead of being thanked for working above and beyond the call of duty, 
you have to fight to get some recognition and thanks. When I was offered some teaching that finished at six, uh, so teaching from four to six, um, I couldn't do it because the nursery shuts at half past five. And I've brought this up with student services in terms of trying to get the university workplace childcare facilities to match teaching times. And they just said there's nothing they can do about it. We have meetings with them um, and uh, they produce minutes. And uh, we have meetings with them and they produce minutes. And we have meetings with them and they produce minutes. Um, Official figures tell a similar story. In September 2004, the university conducted a staff attitude survey, the results of which were very revealing. 72% of staff did not think that change was well managed within the university. 64% of staff did not think managers wanted staff involved in the way Sussex is run. And finally, 15% of staff felt that they had been bullied. The management's spin on it was that they had bad communi there were poor communications. There was clearly a problem with communication in the university. Uh, to which we said, well, actually, isn't it a problem that, in fact, something like 70% of the staff think that their opinions aren't valued in the university? Oh, well, it's a communication problem. The student equivalent, called the National Student Survey, placed us in the bottom 25% of all universities that entered in the country. Unsurprisingly, both groups have reacted strongly against the situation. The AUT has called two votes of no confidence in senior management, while the Students' Union, as well as two no confidence votes of its own, has launched the Sort Us Out campaign, one of the largest movements against bad management ever seen in British higher education. This motion is about us as students investing our time, our money into a student experience and about how the university has consistently failed to deliver the services it's promised us. Okay, now let's vote on to the motion itself. All in favour of the motion? All against? Abstentions? Motion passed. The campaign has led rallies, protests and even written its own newsletter, trying to force senior management into listening to students. In December 2005, it presented a 28-page document to council with that same aim. The administration received it, considered it and responded with another 48-page document promising to involve and consult students, take into account their views and be more transparent. And how was all of this put into practice? The University of Sussex is closing its high-ranking chemistry department. Unless there's a last-minute reprieve, chemistry degrees will no longer be offered after 2007 and resources will be diverted to biosciences and the arts. In March 2006, the Vice-Chancellor announced the Investing in Excellence paper, the new strategic roadmap for the university. It proposed a new approach to investment, withdrawing funds from weaker subjects with fewer prospects and investing in what were perceived to be the strong areas of the university. Well, what Investing in Excellence is attempting to do is to uh, create a new academic profile for the university, um, though that's not yet very clear. As the media were quick to pick up on, the most controversial proposal in the plan was for the refocusing of chemistry into a smaller department of chemical biology was formulated by the Dean. Uh, the Dean imagined that you could run a Department of Chemical Biology, which actually is chemistry, without a fully-fledged chemistry department. And considering that uh, chemical biology makes use of physical chemistry, uh, the decision is um, afraid fundamentally flawed. There was, in my view, and in the committee's view, no logic or sustainability in the proposals to refocus chemistry into, a, in, into a, a small residual department of biological chemistry. The plan was soon shown to be unworkable, yet surely on consulting people with relevant knowledge this conclusion would have been reached immediately. There was no consultation between the senior management and either the, or any, any of the members of faculty other than the head of department who was sworn to secrecy. The Deputy Vice-Chancellor is a biologist, the Dean is a biologist, the Registrar uh, comes from Exeter University. 
uh, and the Vice Chancellor is an economist. How can they possibly judge on chemical matters without external advice? I would ask you this question. It was produced publicly at the last, at literally the last administratively possible moment for it to be circulated to the Senate so that they could diminish and control what they were regarded as being the bad publicity. If you're not opening things up to debate, then what are you afraid of? If there are good reasons for disinvesting in particular areas, and they really are irrefutable, then surely the people working in those areas can't refute them either. It should have been the subject of much wider discussion and consultation. Um, and the way in which the fruits of that discussion were delivered and the time scale on which they were intended to be processed was not good governance. It's a justified move if you believe that your staff are the enemy. If you don't trust your staff. One of the given reasons for closing chemistry was its low student intake, despite its 40% increase in applications this year. We asked Clive Pinkett to comment on this. The argument that the senior management make is the fact that our undergraduate cohort is rather small and the fact that they are worried in the past uh, the model which drives or the financial model which drives how each department is, is funded is, is very much driven by the staff-student ratio and if we only have a relatively small cohort of students then I guess their argument is, is that it's somewhat difficult to then justify why we should actually be replacing these people, not realising, of course, that these people are very important senior scientists. And as a result, they also bring in significant amounts of research income. One of the promises made in the plan was to teach out the current students that had already accepted chemistry places at Sussex. We asked the head of the department about the likely effect on the remaining students' education. I think current students would be affected in two ways. First, firstly, the quality of the programme of chemistry teaching that we could deliver would be much impacted by the loss of some excellent both teachers and researchers in chemistry. Secondly, I would imagine that emotionally these students would be in a very difficult situation. All right, they would be facing the prospects of having a chemistry degree from a university that no longer taught chemistry and their job prospects would be severely hampered. The administration originally stated that the decision was purely academic, despite the belief that the chemistry department would cost £750,000 to maintain after the next RAE, as a smaller department would generate less funding. We're not trying to hide anything. What I'm saying is we don't actually have clear data this year for the actual mechanism that's being used. All right? that's, Excuse that's, me. I'm not trying to hide anything. That's just a state of affairs. If you, you, if you were working in a public company and you budgeted in that way, you would be sacked. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot make decisions, strategic decisions, that you are making if your budgetary information is incorrect or subject to question. There needs to be a, a, a complex and detailed analysis when you make management decisions such as this. Um, and without, I, I received no evidence that that had occurred. Um, and I myself came up with some possible numbers that, that um, did not seem to be fully provided for. If you're talking about closing a lab down for one reason or another, you should have, a, you should have details of the costs of, of this cleanup process, which I saw no evidence of being attained for the, for the original plan. Some of the money that was actually came in as a result of research assessment exercise funding money was not actually being directed direct was directed specifically into the chemistry department it was re, being redistributed amongst the wider university the chemistry department um, is at present in the black we've got um, a, a very good income profile stretching from intellectual property from patent income uh, from EPSRC grants and of course our grade 5 standing. Now according to the calculations currently we're about 80, 70 to 80 thousand pounds in the red but that does not include the money I bring in from the rental of the labs to my company Tokris Cookson Limited. Uh, chemistry has potential to make more money uh, you know a small investment in more members of staff would mean a big return for the university. 
However, the obvious question to ask is that of how the department had been allowed to reach the point where such claims could even be made. There has been the continued disinvestment over the years, as I pointed out earlier, faculty have left, key faculty have left, and have not been replaced. Had they been replaced, as I wanted, I wrote to the Vice-Chancellor last November, for instance, asking for a new lecturer in physical chemistry, which is not my field, and he failed to reply to my letter. So to your question whether there was any any effort uh, to retain me there, no, there was, uh, there was not. I... Uh, I had no contact at all with uh, the Vice Chancellor. There has been no investment in replacing people. Um, in fact, we had 12 fellows of the Royal Society over the period that uh, I've been there, and three Nobel laureates. Uh, nothing has been done to replace any of these people who uh, retired. And secondly, the outstanding young people who have been made offers were given really a, some incentive to go elsewhere. So I don't think that's what one would call uh, investment in excellence. When I was asked um, <clears throat> to join the faculty of Newcastle University last year, I was told by the dean, for instance, that I could be replaced with two junior lecturers from King's College, which has closed its chemistry department. So there's been no real effort to keep key faculty at Sussex in recent times. Uh, well, it was totally obvious there was... Uh no interest uh, from the university, the central administration, in um, well, keeping chemistry as a strong discipline within um, the university science structure. Are you telling us that a department works its guts out for five, six or seven years to get itself in a five star or five position, to get itself the funding to be financially viable, and then you're saying that that funding can be awarded by a vice-chancellor or a senate to another department and let that vital department collapse. Yeah. That's what Tim, I'm hearing. Tim, Tim, I think it would be uh, perhaps the answer to that, yes. Yes. Right. The Common Select Committee report heavily criticised the decision for its lack of consultation and the university's handling of the whole process. Insiders speak of a real shock in central administration at the way in which students responded to the news and the extent to which the proposal was flawed, both in content and implementation. Various concerns are also being raised about the possible future implications of the strategy. We encountered fears over a slashed associate tutor budget and the possibility of other course and department closures, as well as the chance of compulsory redundancies. We think, however, that compulsory redundancies are clearly on the card and that people are being pressurised to leave. And we know, because we know that it's been said at public meetings by senior officers in some of the schools, that there are lists ex existing of staff who are going to be put under pressure to go. This is a massive decision affecting like the whole university. It's not just a case of, I know there's a lot, been a lot of focus on the chemistry department, it's not just a case of, you know, we want to take away the chemistry department, it's also, um, you know, we want to invest posts in these areas, we want to completely restructure, you know, the, the school support system. There's a huge amount of, of change going on and it's not been fully like discussed with the people that it's going to affect. Um, and that's just a mistake, I think. If you're just handing down this decision from on high that, like, I have, you know, I have decreed that that's where we're putting our money and that we're taking it out, <coughs> out of your department and putting it into yours and you're screwed and never mind and you can't say anything about it because I've decided now and it's through SRC and ha ha ha, then no one's going to be happy with that and I think that's what you need to be careful of. Yet this decision, albeit more seriously flawed, simply follows in a long line of top-down style management, largely responsible for the sorts of decisions we have been looking at in this documentary. The implementation of plans such as investing in excellence requires that they be examined in several bodies, of which the most important are Council, Senate and the Vice-Chancellor's Executive Group. In the making of this documentary, we found blame being pointed at all three of these structures for not properly scrutinising and questioning the plans brought before them. The real problem at the university is governance. I mean, I mean, if you have a bad headmaster in a secondary school, the people who are responsible for that are the Board of Governors. So my beef, it's not really with Alistair, um, my beef here is really with the council of the university, because what they've done is they've basically rubber stamped any decision coming out of senior management and basically gone along with every plan to penalise staff for the mistakes that their 
legally, morally and financially responsible for. Indeed, there is official documentation to suggest that some members of council have raised concerns about the body's effectiveness. In 2002, Lord Renton and Mr Jones brought forward a paper that questioned whether the university takes council seriously. And later in 2005, one member raised concerns that documentation sent to council was massaged in order to prevent important issues being discussed and that council was no more than a rubber stamp. A further point made was that the VC is too dominant a voice in council meetings and more needs to be heard from other senior staff. Senate is constituted of academics and six student reps. While it is only tasked with the assessment of academic issues, we found that staff members found it to be largely ineffective in challenging decisions. You need to have some, so, some body almost which is uh, if Senate worked properly there wouldn't be an issue, isn't that right? You wouldn't have this disconnect because you're at Senate, we're at Senate, and the management is at Senate. And I think we need Senate to exercise more control over this over the university. There's nothing, there's no site where you can find out who your representative in Senate is, where you can find out what decisions have been made by Senate, where you can find out what the uh, agendas of the next meetings are, and so on. It's extremely difficult to find out this information unless you go from office to office and, and, and ferret it out on an individual basis. Minutes of Senate and Council are also difficult to attain, despite being public information. Interestingly, at the time of finishing this documentary, the University has not made minutes accessible online since December 2004. Several people we spoke to also raised concerns about the VC's role as Chair of Senate, especially during the meeting after the release of Investing in Excellence. We had quite a, we had uh, not a lot of say on uh, the actual proposal. We only got to speak once each. And in the end, when Roger and I protested against the five minute rule, uh, Mr. Smith worked himself up into what could almost be classed as a rage and uh, rained down from the management table saying, I'm not only the vice chancellor here, I'm also the chair of this meeting, so I get to uh, determine who speaks when and who doesn't. Yet no matter how ineffective Senate and Council may be at holding bad decisions to account, they are still not the ones forming the proposals. Recently it is the Vice Chancellor's Executive Group, otherwise known as VCEG, that has been causing the most contention. This group is the formalisation of the sort of top-down management we have already been looking at. Senior management taking decisions within a small group. VCEG's role is to formulate proposals and work out the direction of the university. This approach to management can be found in the proposals for the group's existence. Committees represent an excessively high overhead, which the institution can ill afford if they do no more than endorse decisions which could be taken executively, or act as a break on efficient working. This effectively reduced the committee's role of wider consultation, and deemed the decisions of committees to be of secondary importance. The underlying role of the executive is therefore unequivocally and unapologetically managerial, whilst acknowledging that ultimate decision-making is vested in the Vice-Chancellor. So the group, lacking in real academic representation, is producing the policy that lies at the heart of most academic and strategic decisions. Many of the staff we spoke to were worried about this new executive and the decisions it has been making, not least the style in which it enacted them. It can often seem as if the best way to deal with um, difficult situations is to get together a small group of people who are going to make the decisions and then uh, impose them on everyone else. Um, if you're in a situation in which you're under pressure, that can seem as if it's the best way to respond. Ultimately, I think it's not the best way to respond because the long-term effect is that you alienate the very people on whom you depend in order to really make the changes that you want uh, work. In September 2005, uh, I think this is about the time that the senior management team started investigating the possibility of an arrangement with a private company called Study Group International, uh, whereby they would establish a centre on campus uh, devoted to providing foundation courses for international students. Uh, this decision was announced in the bulletin of the 2nd of December as a, a fait accompli. This is a decision which the university has made and this is why it's such a great thing for the university. But in fact, at that stage, the decision hadn't yet been approved either by Senate, who were due to uh, examine it on the 9th of December, or by Council, who were due to look at it on the 16th of December. So in effect, the, what was happening, it seems to me, was that the senior uh, management team 
were making the decision and just assuming that, that it was their decision to make and that the Senate and Council were simply there to rubber stamp it and it was quite legitimate for them to announce it as a decision which had been made in advance of the deliberations of Senate and Council. One member of staff was worried that the new management system has very little involvement from academic staff and that balance really seems to be worrying and not very wise in terms of where the university is going. And in general, I think that there's a feeling that there have been cases where senior administrative staff have been involved in making academic decisions. But that is not something that academic staff are very happy about. And we don't generally think that it's a very good idea. Yet this need not be the only way in which proposals are created. Because LifeSci effectively rejected the plans put before them, Senate afforded the school six weeks in order to set up a review group on alternative options. It was constituted of relevant members and involved genuine consultation with different departments. This is a heartening approach that has got a real backing in the life side department and should perhaps be seen as a model for future consultation. To me, the Life Sciences Review Committee has been sort of a model of how a university should be run. A proposal is made, people, people with interests, people with uh, skills and expertise are invited together and, and make a considered valid decision. Um, that sort of is quite heartening to me that, that there's people, academics, are, are, are clearly able to make such sort of, um, have considerable insight and it seems a, a good model for running a university. One staff member wanted to highlight the difference between the formulation of this plan and the previous one. The plan that's about to go forward is quite different from anything that's gone before because it came from the whole of the Life Sciences School. It was made by the Life Sciences School, not the Chemistry Department and not the University's Senior Management. Most members of staff we spoke to felt that the University did not spend its money wisely. We hear from the Senior Management about cuts, cuts and more cuts and how we can save this, that and the other. Why are we not looking at investment? I would like to see us look hard at investment, real investment, not by just sacking a few people and hiring more, but by looking at the money markets, taking advice from colleagues like me over the years who know how to make money. I don't remember any support um, at all. I mean, I'm not so sure that um, the central administration has, has supported many research organisers and um, research groups, but certainly I didn't have any support. I mean, whatever I did was, was all my own. Recently, the university also admitted that management information produced within the university has often been poor, incomplete and or inaccurate. Yet confidence in the senior administration's current plan to remedy the situation with investing in excellence is hard to find. It seems to me that we've been led into the middle of a giant patch of quicksand financially and academically and reputationally, and the same people who got us into that quicksand now say, looks like we're in quicksand, folks, I know the way out. Now, there is a point at which you say, is that really the case? Do you, actually, you're the person that wandered off the path and took us into the quicksand. Are you really the best person to get us out of this quicksand? Do you know what you're doing? Before finishing, it is also worth bringing in some of the points that were raised quite a few times in our discussions with staff. The most damning comments that we heard from staff members were those about the way in which they felt undervalued by the management. Unison said that Many feel increasingly that their views carry little weight and that they have only minor or peripheral input to any decision-making processes. Many members would like to feel that they could engage and more actively participate in the wider university community. While another staff member said that Sussex University is not an institution that encourages open and intellectual debate when it comes to the management of the institution. In the past few years, we have also seen the loss of the Student Experience Officer, as well as the Equality and Diversity Post, which was merged into Human Resources, leading one staff member to say, The commitment to the student experience at Sussex is rhetoric. The area which is one of the most important aspects of university life has been and continues to be underfunded. Overall, the situation at the university is serious and pressing. In the past year, the university has lost 11 members of senior staff, including the Registrar, three Pro Vice-Chancellors, the Director of Finance, the Head of Personnel, one Dean, and four Heads of Department. Overall, it seems that a radical shift is needed in the way that proposals are formulated and implemented within the university, as well as a fundamental change in attitude towards staff and students.
The problems faced were never simply financial and nor is a solution to them. The senior administration, at the end of the day, always has to accept responsibility. It uh, is a fact that uh, the university has gone from what was a few years ago a very healthy financial position with substantial reserves to no reserves and the senior administration have been overseeing this process. I said to the Vice-Chancellor at my very first meeting with him that, you know, I think that the relationship between the Students' Union and the University is overly antagonistic and unnecessarily so and w we need to start working together. Was that taken seriously? It seems to me that the really fundamental problem at Sussex of um, a, a managerial uh, culture which is disdainful of ideas like uh, democratic consultation and democratic accountability. And um, this is the thing which I feel uh, we should really be addressing beyond and above the immediate issues raised by, uh, by the chemistry uh, question. It is not good practice to have clandestine meetings behind closed doors and then develop academic policy. Staff are disenfranchised and not carried along by a management that seems to consistently ignore them. Students, time and again referred to as customers, aren't treated any better. Bad decisions have been made again and again without recourse to past mistakes, the culmination of which has been the publicly condemned proposed chemistry closure. Whether the VC should go or not is a secondary issue to that of the ideological shift that must take place in the way this institution is run. Active engagement must be restored and people must feel ownership of the direction of the university if we are to overcome these troubles. This process is largely but by no means totally up to senior management. Staff, students and the senior administration have a collective responsibility to tackle these problems, the results of which could be seriously damaging to the university if not acted upon.